We're talking today with Greg Saniel of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Greg, start us off with some basic background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Sure, I was born in Hollywood, Florida in uh, 1966, and I graduated from high school in Maryland. My father was in the service. He was also, he was in the Coast Guard. And so as a child, I moved around a lot, uh, seven different addresses, but I was able to go to high school all in one place. And so I graduated from high school in Maryland, and then I went off to the Coast Guard Academy. And it's interesting, uh, you know, as a youngster, you make gr choices that turn out great, but you kind of make them for the wrong reasons. And uh, for me, you know, this in 1984, you know, Cold War is going, raging. And, um, and so the the, the Navy was being built up with, under Reagan and, and all these things were happening. And for me, it, I, I wanted to serve and it came down to, do I go to the Coast Guard Academy or do I go to the Naval Academy? And the decision I made at the time, I was a high school athlete. Mm -hmm. I played soccer and baseball, but I was not a Division I athlete. I was a Division Three athlete. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to the Coast Guard Academy. And, uh, and probably the best decision I ever made, but if you think about why I made it, it doesn't make any sense today. Okay, I guess, of course, your father was career Coast Guard. Um, is that something that, that made the Coast Guard Academy more appealing, or did you really kind of want to do the Navy so you could do something different? Uh, it, it made me certainly aware of the Coast Guard Academy, and um, and in long uh, tradition of service in, in both my, my, my father and his family and my mom and, and uh, uh, their family. So. I, I think I was predestined to, to join the military at some point, mm -hmm. but the Naval Academy had appeal graduating from a Maryland high school because mm -hmm. it, yeah. it was nearby. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I, I went to the Coast Guard Academy and I, I think, like I said, one of the greatest decisions I ever made. Okay. Now, my understanding is admission to the Coast Guard Academy is pretty competitive, isn't it? Yeah, it's different. The Coast Guard Academy is, uh, it's just merit. Yeah. Whereas the other service academies, you have to get an appointment from a mm -hmm. congressman or, or something but the Coast Guard Academy is true merit. Okay, and how large is an entering class at that time? When I went there, we, uh, we started with just under 300 students mm -hmm. and we graduated uh, about 135 of those. It was the 292, I think. We graduated about 135 uh, of those that started. And the Coast Guard Academy never got much, when I was there, never had more than about 800 students at any one time which when you think about the high school I graduated from, my graduating class was over 800 students. Mm -hmm. So I went to a high school of over 3,200 students. Okay, uh, now did some of those people who didn't, so you graduated on schedule? From the Coast Guard Academy, I did. Yeah. Okay, now did some of the people who didn't graduate with you, who started with you, you think they eventually finished and they just got behind or, or did they just wash out in, along the way? It's a very structured program. Um, we have a few at, we're at, the call, at the time were called reverters, mm -hmm. people that took five years to complete the four year program. Right. Um, maybe a half dozen to a dozen of those and there's probably a few of those, again, maybe a half dozen or so that I started with that graduated in, in 1989. But the rest uh, left the academy at some point. Oh, okay, well describe the curriculum then a little bit. It sounds like it must be pretty rigorous. Uh, very rigorous. Um, there's only seven majors. Uh, there, I think there was three engineering, a math major, like a, a science major and then like a history government major. Um, I was a marine engineer, which is mechanical engineering uh, with ship design, ship propulsion, naval architecture. Uh, but yeah, very, very rigorous engineering focused um, program, but also it's, you know, every minute of your day is scheduled at a military academy. And uh, for some people that's just too much, very, a lot of physical requirements, mm -hmm. marching requirements, yeah, the, all the military, military science type things that are then layered on top of a, a rigorous engineering curriculum. Okay, and then are you at, at some point doing swimming, life-saving, stuff in the water kinds of exercises too? Uh, ab absolutely. Um, there, not only do you have a rigorous engineering program, but again, like I said, you have these military science requirements that are layered in. And in addition, you have uh, physical phys ed requirements that are added on top of that engineering curriculum. So it was not uncommon for an engineering student with all the labs to, you know, 18, 19 credits um, every semester, and that's from the get-go. Mm -hmm. All right, and when people were, were leaving, do you think it was more just 
the way of life there, or they couldn't hack the academics, or they couldn't hack it physically? Uh, I, I think uh, probably a little bit of everything. But again, it's um, every minute of your day is taken up. You have no privacy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's a lifestyle that's not for everybody. And, uh, and I think a lot of them, many that left were just like, you know, the, we, we talk about uh, the, the barracks at a military academy. Mm -hmm. it, it just teaches you to put up with an incredible level of just a nuisance, if you will. And I think just some people, it, it, it's just, I admit, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, when I talk to people who they went through West Point, one of the parts of the description is that conditions sort of improve from one year to the next. It's absolutely the worst in your first year as you just start it, and then you get more privileges and freedom, and life is better, at least, as a senior than it is when you start. Now, was it just the same all the way through in the Coast Guard? Uh, it, it, ex you're exactly right. Um, you know, we talk about when you enter a military academy, uh, all your basic uh, rights and, you know, your constitutional rights are taken away from you the minute you show up, and then they're given back to you one at a time as privileges, okay. uh, kind of described like that. So, so a absolutely, uh, much more freedoms, everything from, you know, the ability to wear civilian clothes when you have a, have a day off kind of thing. Um, those increase as you as you work your way through and, and I had a unique opportunity to uh, you know the service academies do an exchange program and for the Coast Guard Academy at the time we would send uh, three cadets to each of the other military service academies for a semester their mm -hmm. junior year and I had the opportunity to go to the Naval Academy which was my second choice so I went there and, and you wear you know wear your Coast Guard uniform and you know, my blue uniform and a sea of white uniforms kind mm -hmm. of thing and I had a great, great uh, experience doing that. And, and that only reinforced uh, the fact that the, going to the Coast Guard Academy was uh, the right thing to do. Because I had the misfortune, if you will, I went to the Naval Academy in the fall. And that same summer was the year that uh, Top Gun came out. And so everybody at the Naval Academy thought they were Tom Cruise at the time, if you will, or were going to become Tom Cruise. And, and so it was just... Uh, you know, it was just, an, timing is everything, and I, I never have good timing. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and, okay, so, okay, so you got to, so when, when do you actually finish that? 1988, I graduated from the uh, Coast Guard Academy, and at the time, every graduate went to, went to a ship. Okay, I guess that was the other thing I was thinking of asking. Okay, uh, I know with other service academies, they will often do something in the summer where they're actually out with the unit or the Navy guys will be on a ship or something. Did you have some version of that in the Coast Guard? A or? Absolutely. Uh, every summer was, was spoken for. Um, some summers, you know, I spent uh, a lot of time on the Eagle, uh, which is the Coast Guard at uh, uh, um, a tall ship uh, right. sailing that. Um, I did that. I, I spent uh, uh, a, a good summer on uh, on the Ingham, which was, uh, and I was filling the role as a, a very junior enlisted person on the Ingham. You know, I was in the scullery washing the dishes and cleaning and where up Where was domestic. the Ingham based? Uh, the Ingham was based out of Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. and uh, we we did a patrol with them. And Ingham, a fascinating ship. It was built in the Depression. Uh, it was a, a WPA project, uh, but it was a one of the nicest riding ships I've ever been on, but you know, it was 50 years old mm -hmm. when I was on there, so it had 50-year-old uh, living conditions <laughs> and things like that. But, uh, but a fantastic ship, um, really. I, again, I, I still marvel at uh, what a nice ride that was. Yeah, and being on the Eagle, I don't know, had you done much actual sailing uh, as it before? Z almost none, okay. uh, and it was on the Eagle. And, and additionally, I. Um, the Eagle was chosen to represent the United States at the Australian Bicentennial, which happened in uh, like January 1988. And so I was at that point, so I'm a senior at the, so I got the most privileges, mm -hmm. if you will. And I was selected and we had, we had a group of, um, there's 24 first class or senior cadets. And then and the, the, the sophomores were split in half. And so one group sailed the Eagle from Connecticut to Australia and then flew home. And then I flew to Australia and sailed the Eagle back. So uh, like New Year's, it, it's a great story, but we, we boarded a plane in Hartford on like 
December 27th or, or yeah, December 27th, and uh, it stopped a number of places to refuel. Uh, there was a charter. We stopped and uh, we were in like um, Fiji. They had just had a coup, so we couldn't leave. <laughs> and uh, we finally get to Australia uh, in the afternoon on the 30th, you know, with 18 hour flights and uh, all the refueling stops and the time or the date line, you know, it was like we left on the 27th, got there on the 30th. It was like three days. What, you know, what happened here? Um, but yeah, and then so at that point, I was essentially done with academics. And then I was part of the, the team that sailed the Eagle back. And we made some wonderful, wonderful port calls on, all over the Pacific and uh, the West Coast of the U.S., Panama. And, and we pulled back to New London um, the beginning of May and then graduated in May. Wow, yeah. okay. Did you have any interesting weather along the way? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we we're in the Pacific uh, in the winter. Um, you know, we were in the, 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 in the Southern Hemisphere, it was still the summer, but it mm -hmm. was still, it was, you know, the end of the winter when we crossed the equator into the Northern part. But uh, we went up to Seattle and had some uh, amazing weather. Uh, one time we were, going, we were going from Seattle to San Francisco and it was, uh, you know, just, a typical West Coast storm. I mean, probably good 50 footers in there, and um, the the main deck of the ship with no one was allowed on top side except for the the watch, and they were they were you know we were buckled in if you will. And um, but I'll never forget. I, I had the watch, and we were heading into these you know 30, 40, 50 footers, um, just trying to make way, and we were headed due south, and every hour when we plotted the position, we were one mile north of where we were before. So we we're you know, making turns for eight or nine knots and, and, and making negative one over the ground kind of thing. When you're in the middle of all of that, do you ever wonder if you're gonna actually get out of it? No, I, no, I mean, you gotta, you gotta trust your ship kind of okay. thing. And, and part of that was probably because I was a marine engineer, naval architect, and you design all that capacity into the ship to, to you know, beam, beam winds and things like that. So uh, you got to have faith. If you don't have faith in the ship, yeah, I can imagine that would be a, a white knuckle ride. Yeah. No doubt. How big is the Eagle? Uh, from the bowsprit to the stern is 295 feet. It displaces 1,800 tons, uh, but length on the water line is about 230 yeah. feet. Yeah, so it's a substantial enough ship. It's, it's not like being on the Santa Maria or something. Oh, like no, Columbus. no, not at all. Yeah, if they could make it, then you probably can. Exactly. All right, so you, you had your pretty good share of adventures already just for the mm -hmm. academy. You finish, and then what is your first duty station when you get out? Or do you get more schooling, or what happens nope. next? Nope, uh, you graduate, and the, the, the Coast Guard approach is we throw these junior officers on ships. Uh, they lead a division on a ship, and we expect them to lead and figure it out and, and uh, a lot of learn by doing, if you will. So the, my first ship was, uh, I was on the Confidence. I was home ported in Port Canaveral, Florida. And uh, it had, the, the ship was built in the 60s, but it was, it was decommissioned and it had just spent uh, like three, two or three years through a major midlife, it was called MMA, major midlife, um, I forget what the A stands for. but. <laughs> But it was uh, availability, it was a major midlife availability. And it got new engines, um, just kind of a stem to uh, ventilation systems, all the, all the systems were replaced. Um, and they, the biggest thing was they added a, st uh, they used to blow the exhaust out the, out the stern, mm -hmm. and they, so they put in a stack, which was a lot less maintenance. And so that, that was my first ship, 210 feet long, had uh, 12 officers, about 65 enlisted, had a flight deck, and, uh, and I was there as the communications officer. And so the flight deck would have been for helicopter? Yep, helicopter okay. flight deck. All right. Uh, and how long were you there? I was on there for two years. Okay. And we, and we commissioned, my very first ship as an officer we commissioned, and, and we'll probably get to it at the end, but one of my last ships uh, when my seagoing career ended was a decommissioning. Okay. So, all right. So, what uh, things kind of stand? What experiences stand out from that first tour? Uh, again, doing the commissioning part of it, um, which is uh, you learn a lot about the ship. You've got to develop all the policy and procedure for the ship. Uh, it, a number of things. There are a couple of real highlights. I think as you know, we were take our very first exercise or with the ship was uh, with the crew was a, was a huge Navy exercise. It was a 
um, off the coast of Virginia. It was everything, carriers, amphibious landing, everything involved with that. And as that exercise wound down, we were headed home to, uh, to our home port. We had not been to our home port yet. And on our way, uh, there's a kind of an unusual looking ship out there. And so we go to check it out, which is what you do in the Coast Guard. You, you're always checking things out. And we check it out. It was a, it was a, a Soviet AGI or auxiliary intelligence collecting ship. Mm -hmm. And of course we call it in and next thing you know, we spent the next three days, we spent the next three days kind of looking at each other, basically mm -hmm. taking pictures of each other <laughs> and filing reports. But the, that ship had been there monitoring the exercise. And so, uh, you know, so we're getting a lot of national command tasking, um, dealing with the, with the collection ship and eventually someone took that over for us. And so then we, uh, we head home and, th and then the, 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 the confidence, um, being out of Port Canaveral, we used to do usually four week patrols, four or five week patrols, and, and it was all spent um, at the time, the drug smuggling was what we did. And uh, at the time, the, the, the threat, if you will, was mostly um, small fishing boats smuggling marijuana in large loads mm -hmm. uh, to the north. Um, to, towards Florida, and so there was a couple of choke, natural choke points, the Yucatan Pass, um, the Windward Pass, and so we would do those patrols and, and basically look for, for smuggling vessels, and, and when I was on the Confidence, we were working this, we were working some intelligence with another ship, um, and we, between the two of us, we were able to identify a drug smuggling vessel and, and took it down and then arrested the folks. And then I was the prize crew that brought this ship back to Key West. Mm -hmm. And so it was me, I had an, uh, you know, an engineer and, and someone to steer. And uh, we, the ship was, was about 13 miles north of Columbia and we had to take it to Key West. So it was okay. about 600 miles. And, uh, and it was just, it was, a, it was a weird experience. You know, we're just like sitting there on the bales of marijuana kind of thing. We're, we're probably pushing it a little more than it should go, and the steering cable would always break, and we'd have to splice it together with a bunch of U-bolts, and it was about a four-day trip, and it was, the, uh, the confidence would kind of, they were sort of shadowing us, Good. but you know, all we had was a, a magnetic compass, but every once in a while, they'd go off to investigate something, and they might come, not come back for, till the next day, <laughs> kind of thing, but we were making our way, we kept radio contact okay. with them, and, yeah. And they, so they at least know where you were. Yeah, yeah. But it was uh, we were we were pushing it, and uh, so the exhaust manifold was uh, was really really hot. It's almost like a if you can think of like a muffler, mm -hmm. and it was up against the pilot house. And every once in a while, the the wood on the pilot house would kind of flash off, and so we'd have to put it out with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> you know, we're surrounded by marijuana, kind of thing, and and it was just. The steering cable probably broke 10 times and, and a couple of fires. And we got, we were literally inside the channel going into Key West and we just lost, I, I don't know what happened, but we lost everything. Probably salt water got in somewhere. And uh, so we lost propulsion, we lost and all communicate, we just dead in the water. And so it was a, you know, a 600 mile trip and we made it 599 of them and <laughs> had to get towed the last mile. So it was kind of frustrating. But so it, it, it was just wonderful. I was a boarding officer when I was on the when I was on the Confidence. So, you know, I'd go over the rail and, and we'd start looking at vessels that we would stop, do the inspections, and you know, under international law, it was just, it was wonderful. It was a great experience. I mean, you know, to think I was 21, 22 years old mm -hmm. doing this was uh, amazing. So, so what sort of responses do you get when you're boarding a vessel? Uh, they, they know the deal. I mean, you're talking to them on the radio. You're asking the, we call the pre-boarding questions ahead of time. You're figuring out the flag and, mm -hmm. you know, you've, um, it, there's all it, it, international law and U.S. law. I mean, there's all, as a warship, you can, you can, ins you can stop a vessel and verify their papers basically. Mm -hmm. And, and, but, you know, based on the pre-boarding questions, you can, you know, you might have more suspicion than not to want to actually go over and check and things like that. So it, 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 it was a great experience. And then, you know, also in the Windward Pass, um, you know, every once in a while, uh, you know, the, at the time, the Haitians might try to 
emigrate to, mm -hmm. to the U.S. in a manifestly unsafe way, you know, 40-foot boat with 150 people on it or something where nobody can move, and that's just, you know, that's just a tragedy waiting mm -hmm. to happen. And so if we, if we find those, we take, give everybody life jackets, take them off, and we usually, and we bring them back to Haiti just because there's, they, there's just no way they're going to make it safely to the mm -hmm. United States trying to do that. So, I mean, uh, like I said, it was, it was great. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Okay. Now, were there any hurricanes in Florida in the time you were down there? No, um, I don't remember of avoiding a hurricane there on that ship. But I, I, one of the um, real exciting moments, we were in Port Canaveral, which is right near uh, Kennedy Space Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in port, and so we had a, where we tied up in Port Canaveral, we had a great view of where they would launch the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And the, that, when I was on there, that was when they resumed the space shuttle after right. the Challenger disaster. So that very first one after that was just amazing. The, you know, the, the RVs and everything, everybody was able to watch it. And we had a bird's eye view. With, and it, it was great because we could, um, on the ship, that we were tied up in port, we could watch it. And we had all the high-powered binoculars. And so we could really got a, an amazing view there. Okay. Now, uh, the, the Gulf War starts while you're in Florida, because it's 89? No. Uh, uh, the original one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did that have any ripple effects where you were, or did your job just go on as normal? No, we, we were doing the, the mission there, and the, the, the counter-drug mission. Okay. All right. Uh, you get to the... Now, how long was your original service obligation? I graduated from the academy was five years. Okay. All right. So you spent the first two uh, in Florida. Mm -hmm. And what's the next assignment? Next assignment, I was incredibly fortunate. My, I was selected for command. And my next assignment, I was the commanding officer of a ship, uh, the Point Whitehorn. It's an 82-foot uh, patrol boat. Is it Point White what? Whitehorn. Whitehorn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 82-foot patrol boat, one officer. I was a lieutenant JG. Mm -hmm. I was 23 years old. I was the captain of the ship. And I had a crew of 10 enlisted, uh, 65 tons, 82 feet, and the home port was St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. It was amazing. It was what I mean. It was an amazing experience uh, to live in a place like St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Now this is uh, now Hurricane Hugo, which pretty much devastated the Virgin Islands. It happened in '89, and I got there in '90. Mm -hmm. So they were still recovering, but um, but it was just. You know, I was 23 and unmarried. It was just a, an amazing time. And then the responsibility and the ex leadership experience uh, being the commanding officer was, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay. Now, did you have uh, any uh, senior enlisted who were older than you? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think uh, the, I had a chief engineer. Um, you know, he's, He'd been in the service at least 10 years. My executive petty officer had probably been in at least 12. He was a, a first-class bosun mate. I think, generally speaking, the only people that were younger than me were the, the non-rated uh, that, that were just coming out of the uh, seamen and firemen that were just coming out of boot camp. This is the kind of assignment that a lot of people would try to get? Uh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. I mean, a, a junior officer, uh, entry level, that uh, a second tour command is just just coveted and, and the patrol boat life is I'm still doing the same missions I'm still mm -hmm. doing the counter drug mission and uh, and the, the uh, you know the migrant mission mm -hmm. but at this time in the Caribbean it had changed a little bit most it was it wasn't big fishing boats that were bringing bales of marijuana but it had sort of shifted a little bit into cocaine at this point mm -hmm. and so a lot of it was airdrops um, you know the plane would fly up and then throw the the bales out and there would be a small fast boat waiting to collect them in a location. So it was just kind of a little, you know, continuing playing that cat and mouse game. And how effective do you think you were at stopping or limiting that kind of traffic? Well, I mean, you can, uh, all the intelligence estimates would say, you know, X number of tons were produced for the U.S. and this, this small percentage was actually interdicted. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it, that's one of those counterfactuals, I think. But yeah. it, it was, it was, that's what we needed to do. That was the, you know, the war on drugs was happening. Right. Right. Um, it was a national priority to stop as much as we could, and, and that's what we were out there doing. Okay. 
And, and did you have any success at it? I mean, were you catching I, any of the small boats? Absolutely, or? absolutely. Uh, we, when I was on the, the Point Whitehorn, we, I, I, I'd, I'd have to look it up, but we made at least three or four. It's um, a lot like, you know, fighter planes. When you shoot someone down, mm -hmm. you paint a silhouette. Yeah. We would have, we would put a cocaine snowflake <laughs> or a marijuana leaf on the side of the ship. And, um, and we, we put, you know, three, four, five of those up, I want to say, when I was on the Point Whitehorn. Okay. So what sort of the start and end dates for that tour? The two years. That was from 1990 to 1992. Okay. And uh, I was there when the, uh, when they actually, you know, they started the, the build up in the Gulf War in 89. Right. And then they actually executed uh, in 91. And I remember I was just, I was, I was in port and that happened. And, you know, we recalled the crew and just waited to see what was going to happen. And uh, um, fortunately, um, you know, we, we had to do a lot more. There's a, there's a big Hess oil refinery in St. Croix, on the south side of St. Croix. And so we did a lot of port security there, just seeing if there was gonna be any kinds of, you know, in reaction to the invasion, uh, mm -hmm. that would be a target. And so I remember doing, doing spending a lot of time. Um, right, right, yeah, you've got your area. dates right. Mine were off that time. Because, yes, yeah. Gulf War, that one's 91. The next yeah. one's 03, I got yeah. that one right before, but okay. Uh, yeah, so, so there is sort of a, the, but the ripple effect for you at that point, it's not that there's an expectation that a lot of you might get deployed to the Gulf or something uh, for that first war, but rather possible security risks in your area. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, we, we stepped that up. And, and then just, but at the same time, there, the realization that, you know, the, the drug mission is not going away. So mm -hmm. it was kind of, you know, we were still, main, still doing all that, but, mm -hmm. Uh, um, but just understanding that, you know, the, just the heightened awareness um, that you really saw several years later uh, after 9-11, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's those security things that you might have taken for granted, like, you know, who's going to bother an oil refinery? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it's like, hey, that, we got to make sure that we keep that place right. safe. Okay. Other particular things that happened in that tour that you haven't brought into the service, the story here yet? No, it, w it was just, like I said, amazing experience, amazing folks. I mean, that's, uh, that were the crew. I mean, it was just, I, I learned so much about myself as a leader. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was just, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Okay. So what do you get next? Uh, next, I, uh, it was interesting. I was the normal, af after you've been kind of the high on the mountain, if you will, the next step for most people uh, that have uh, that experience is to go to a, a command center. Uh, like a search and rescue coordination mm -hmm. center and i had so i had an assignment officer call me and say you're you're going to go to one and i said okay and, and then my orders never came and and we were in the virgin islands we would get our messages came in the mail <laughs> kind of thing um, and so they just never came and didn't think anything of it and then i got a call hey you i actually was selected to interview to be a, a flag lieutenant or an admiral's aide we call it um, and so that was my next assignment. I was an admiral's aide for the 7th District Commander, which was the headquartered in Miami. And, it cut, and their area of responsibility was the entire Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, I, I worked for Admiral Bill Leahy and uh, just a really, really great leader. Um, everything that happened in the Coast Guard at the time was happening in the 7th District. And as his aide, um, you know, I was able to sit in in meetings and see the decision making. I really equated it to, it was like getting a graduate degree in the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. Just spending those two years um, doing those kinds of things. And it was, you know, I did a lot of, you know, I scheduled travel and unit visits and, and things like that. But at the same time, that opportunity to just sit in these discussions and see these meetings. And, you know, I would, I would meet the, you know, when the secretary flew in, I would usually, the secretary of transportation, you know, I was there to greet them and do all the logistics to coordinate that to make the visit happen. So it was it was a great experience. All right. Uh, any particularly notable events or incidents that took place while you were there? Yeah, I think probably, uh, you know, one of the biggest ones was the um, what happened was that there was a lot of unrest in Haiti mm -hmm. and very and there was an election coming up and there was significant concern at the national level that um, an influx of Haitians into Miami uh, 
being on the news was, was politically untenable. And so there was a huge effort to make sure that they didn't have this, man, undertake all these manifestly unsafe voyages. Mm -hmm. And so there was a large armada that was sent down there that included Navy ships mm -hmm. um, around Haiti to, because of the, uh, I want to say there had been a coup or something. And so they didn't want this. Uh, and so my, the Admiral that I worked for, he, was, he had operational control. There was probably 30 ships on this exercise and five or six of them were capital Navy ships. And mm -hmm. so that was just kind of interesting that the, you know, the Navy was working for the Coast Guard at this time. Okay, and basically it was really to prevent a large uh, flow of refugees, and especially ones going out in unsafe craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just avoid that, that part of a humanitarian disaster. Exactly, exactly. All right, uh, now would the Admiral, did he go, Admiral go out to check up on that or did he just coordinate all of that back from the headquarters? Oh, I, both. Absolutely. I mean, um, he, I remember traveling with him and we hit eight, eight, we took a helicopter and we hit probably eight ships in a day, okay. just, uh, you know, sitting down, talking with the crews, thanking them, explaining to them, you know, as any good leader would do, explaining to them why they're here, how important it is and, and, uh, and, and, and keep at it, you know, kind of thing. All right. And what impression did you have of the leadership in the Coast Guard at that point? Oh, I was just in, completely impressed. I mean, it, it's just, it, it, it's a great organization, um, you know, really cares about its people, develops people, and uh, just gives them more, you know, I, I used to joke that, uh, you know, the Coast Guard seems like they give you just a little bit more opportunity and responsibility than you probably deserve, <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you grow into it. Mm -hmm. And did they generally treat each other and the junior officers well? I, I think so, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can have command situations where there are people that are jerks. Uh, <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong, that happens and it happened in the Coast Guard. It's, it's probably still happening in the Coast Guard. But the number of those is less and less. And, and I will say that when, when they're identified, they're, it, it's very swift that they're removed because it's, uh, it's, in, it's so important for the, I mean, you think about it, you've got to accomplish the mission. And, uh, you know, you, got, you care about your people and you got to accomplish a mission. If you got a jerk in charge, that's not going to work. And you're not a very large organization, so it might be kind of hard to hide somebody like that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so that's that assignment. So what follows after that? After that, um, just kind of, you know, being a, an admiral's aide is, uh, you know, I've got a great advocate, so I was able to go back to sea, which, uh, and I was the commanding officer of a 110-foot patrol boat, uh, 165 tons. This had, um, I was a lieutenant at this point in my second command. I had a lieutenant JG as an executive officer, and I had 16 enlisted crew members, including a chief engineer. And that was out of San Juan, Puerto Rico. Again, I'm going back mm -hmm. to the Caribbean, which I love, uh, and really focused on the drug mission. And one of the best things, the, the, the 110, 110 foot, um, at this point, I'm, the ship's only five years old. Um, so it's, uh, it's in great shape, it's fast. Um, you know, it's a 30 knot ship. Um, so we can chase anything down at this point. And uh, again, just doing the mission. Uh, you know, we're, we're on, in, out of Puerto Rico, we're usually either in the Mona Pass, um, which is between Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. Uh, we're either on that side, um, you know, the, there's a migrant, um, Dominicans trying to get mm -hmm. to Puerto Rico, or we're on the east, we call Anagata, which is the east side down the island chain, um, and there that's almost all just counter drug mission, you know, with all the islands all over the place. And between the, when I was on the, it was called the Atu, island class cutter, between the Atu and the Point Whitehorn. Um, you know, the, I, I was able to make port visits at every island, every island nation in the Caribbean. Um, so, I mean, it was just seeing the world, doing the mission. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Yeah. Are these places consistently welcoming? Are they happy to have the Coast Guard show up? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, uh, especially the Caribbean, the islands are, are all based on tourism. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're coming to spend some money and <laughs> relax yeah. for a couple of days. So, absolutely. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things the Coast Guard, of course, gets associated with is, is going to be rescues and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you've talked a lot about the uh, drug interdiction, but would you also go and assist boats that were in trouble, or did smaller boats do that? Or 
Oh, a a absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I remember, uh, you know, on the Point Whitehorn, it was a big, it was a large, it was a, probably a 600 foot um, bulk carrier that was disabled. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we went out and, you know, obviously we're not gonna tow it or anything, but we were there, if they had to abandon ship, and eventually, you know, commercial salvage came and, uh, and towed them off and we were released. Um, you know, sailboats get dismasted, distressed. Mm -hmm. um, when I was on the Attu, uh, you know, when I was on the Attu, one year we had like 16 named hurricanes come through the mm -hmm. Caribbean and uh, it seemed like, you know, we were doing disaster relief in um, Antigua and Barbuda. We went to Antigua, picked up all kinds of supplies, a couple of Royal Antigua and Barbuda Marines, and then we went to Barbuda. Um, and, and delivered all those supplies and took some injured people back, you know, mm -hmm. so we were the kind of the first relief. So absolutely, we're doing that all the time. I think, you know, we, we sort of, in the Coast Guard, I don't want to say take that for granted, but you know, that's, that's our DNA, that's what we do. And uh, so, yeah, it was happening all the time. I remember when I was on the Yacht 2, we had it was one of these like mega luxury yachts, probably, you know, 140 foot got disabled and it was drifting on the rocks and we were able to get a tow line on that and pulled that off, you know, save somebody about a million plus mm -hmm. insurance claim kind of thing. So a absolutely doing that all the time. Okay, but that's sort of standard operating procedure mm -hmm. as opposed to something like a drug bust that, that's rarer and... Right, uh, right. And, and it's one of those, you know, you're, you're on patrol for, to do the drug mission, but the minute search and rescue comes up, you stop the drug mission and you're gonna go do the search and rescue case. Okay. Now, by this time, you've gone past your original service obligation from going to the academy. Mm -hmm. uh, now, had you just intended all along, basically, to make a, a career in the Coast Guard or stay in for a long time, or did you just kind of play it by ear from one hitch to another? Well, I think, uh, you know, when I was on my first ship, um, I said, I, I, I love going to sea. I was like, all right, I, I want to be a commanding officer. Mm -hmm. So then my second tour, I'm a commanding officer. I'm like, all right, I need a new goal. <laughs> and, and so at the, t and at the time, the biggest ships uh, in my kind of specialty area were 378 foot cutters, and, and those were uh, captain commands, mm -hmm. 06 commands. I was like, I really want to work towards that. That's kind of okay. my new goal. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was just having fun. It mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, I used to joke, you know, it beats working. It, it didn't, it never really felt like work. Uh, to this point in the Coast Guard, and it really didn't. I just enjoyed what I was doing. Um, I think it was just kind of that sense so, sense of service and uh, and just with great people, you know, working with great people, identify with the mission. It, it just, it really keeps you motivated. Okay. Were you still single at this point? Uh, no, I got married. Um, I got married between uh, Point Whitehorn and becoming an Admiral's aide. And, uh, and my first daughter was born in Puerto Rico uh, when I was on the Attu, my oldest daughter. Okay, and so as you're going around to these different assignments, is your family basically able to live wherever you're based? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, being on the ships, obviously, I, you know, I'm missing birthdays and anniversaries mm -hmm. and things like that, and uh, that, that, that's hard, that's hard, but you know, you, you're really torn because you, you enjoy doing what you're doing, and, and I mean, that, that's who I am, I mean, uh, you know, and, I, my family knows that's what I love to do, kind of. Right. Thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I guess also you're not gone. It's not like you're gone for a year at a time or more right. than that, like in some other kinds of assignments. It, exactly. And so far, there's not places where your family cannot follow you, which may happen if there's people going to Iraq or something like exactly. that. Okay. Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, so. Okay. So let's kind of get back in, 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 into your sequence because mm -hmm. I'd asked. Okay. You, you decided to stay in. So you've done the ATU, um, and then the next job was? Uh, well, at this point, I'm a lieutenant. I've been in eight years, and in the Coast Guard, uh, you, you've got to have, um, you got to have an operational specialty. Mm -hmm. For me, it was going to sea, all right, so mm -hmm. I've got that. But you also have to have another specialty, uh, because you can't be on ships your whole career. And, uh, and I did not have, and you get that by usually going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so I did not have that. So now I need to go to graduate school soon, and because uh, I, I um, and, and it's very important to time going to graduate school correctly. Uh, if you want to be for me for a sailor, I've got to go or cutterman. I've got to go to graduate school right after a cutter assignment, do my graduate program, which can be anywhere from one to two years, mm -hmm. uh, because then when you're 
when you come out of that, you do what's called a payback tour, and that's three or four years. And if, if I'm on the beach for more than seven years, I can't go back to sea. Mm -hmm. So I've got to time it right. And so the timing was right for me, and, and so I applied for financial management. And uh, I was able to, uh, I was selected, I was fortunate, because it was like my one shot, that was my one window, really. And, uh, and so then I went to, uh, the Coast Guard sent me to uh, graduate school uh, in financial management, I got an MBA in, in finance and operations Where did you go? Management. I went to Penn State. Okay. <clears throat> and it was an 18 month program, which was ideal. Um, I was able to complete it in 18 months, because then I, I graduated in, uh, December um, 97, and so I started January 98. <clears throat> uh, I went to headquarters in Washington, D.C. I was at systems resource management, um, and I, was, uh, you know, I had several accounts. I was an allotment fund coordinator, and, and, uh, and it just did the, the finance and budget work of the Coast Guard for the engineering branch of the okay. Coast Guard. So why did you pick finance? To be honest, it's a lot like, why did I pick the Coast Guard Academy over the Naval Academy? The biggest thing was finance was one where they encouraged their graduates to continue in their operational career path. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it, I, I wasn't sure I was 100% interested in it at the time, but given some of the other options, it, it seemed like the, the most flexible, if you will, to maintain my seagoing career. Okay. How easy or hard was it to kind of go back to school? Because now you're in a civilian academic setting doing this program. Uh, it was, you know, I was concerned because I was, I was an engineer, I was not an accountant, mm -hmm. and I was gonna get, you know, a master's, master's level work in, in some unfamiliar areas. So I, you know, I got, that was back when you went to bookstores and, <laughs> you know, got a lot of study guides mm -hmm. and, you know, I had to take the, uh, the GMAT mm -hmm. um, and everything. I studied up for that, I prepared myself Okay. for it and and but you know I still I'm going back I'm going to grad school at um, you know 97 I'm, I'm uh, you know I graduated when I was 31 um, and I was probably just a little bit older than, than my classmates in, in the MBA program but but it, it was a great experience all right okay so you go to Washington is mm -hmm. that a two-year hitch in Washington or it was uh, it was three and a half years okay. it was a three and a half year uh, assignment and then um, like I said working on the budget it, it was a great experience I had uh, um, I was ass like temporarily assigned this is an interesting one I was temporarily assigned to the uh, presidential inaugural committee and so it was about a 90-day assignment um, and I was the officer in charge of troop control which was basically everything that happened on the grounds of the Capitol, from the 21-gun salute battery, to the Herald Trumpets, to the cordon, um, the actual ceremony. You know, I was in a little command. If you've ever seen a picture of the inauguration on the steps there of the Capitol, there's this window behind it. It's a committee room in the Capitol with the curtains drawn. I was in behind that glass in that window. You know, we were watching, listening, and I had like because the, the biggest thing was a 21 gun salute had to go off at exactly mm -hmm. the right second you know so we had like five different methods to signal to, for them to fire because they were on the other side of the of the capitol obviously but that was and that was for the inaugural that was when it was gore bush yeah when it 2000, was yeah when 2001 it was hung, by the time yep, you're doing it yeah yep when it's hung up in the courts and everything and so we were planning we knew we were going to inaugurate somebody but we didn't know who <laughs> And, and then, but then there's a whole group that works on the parade um, on the, uh, you know, they were on the other side of the building, if you will, but they had no idea who to coordinate with. You know, is it going to be the marching band from the University of Tennessee or the marching band from the University of, of Texas kind of mm -hmm. thing? So they, they were kind of, they, so when there was finally, when that was finally resolved, their, their planning timeline was significantly compressed. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it was, it was amazing. You know, I, one of the things, we had to know like every possible way to get from point A to point B in the Capitol through the basement and everything. So that was a, that was a neat experience. But a lot less prospect of anyone storming the Capitol anywhere along yep, the Yeah, back yeah. then, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, so you are then in, so you're still in Washington when 9-11 happens? No, uh, in, in, I wanna say February, March timeframe, I uh, transfer to, I'm XO, executive officer, mm -hmm of the Dependable, which is out of Cape May, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, just like the Confidence, 210 feet, 
12 officers, about 65, 70 enlisted. So I'm the XO on the dependable. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so same same mission, uh, we, although we do a little bit more fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did we did about half of our patrols in the Caribbean and about half of our patrols up like off Georgia's bank doing mm -hmm. the fisheries monitoring and enforcement up there. Um, so we did, a, and, and so we did a lot. We did one patrol up north. We can get back to the search and rescue. We mm -hmm. did uh, six commercial fishing boats we had to tow back. You know, they would go out, break down, mm -hmm. crappy weather, salvers aren't going to come out there. All right, so we would, we would tow them back. So, you know, a lot of seamanship, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. getting those tows set and getting those folks back um, safely. But, yeah, so we, I'm on the dependable. We did a patrol. Um, we had an engineering issue, and so we come back from that patrol and we go straight to the Coast Guard Yard, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. It was a propeller hub thing. So we get dry dock, they fix the propeller hub, and we're coming out, and then we're going home, and we have on Wednesday, we get back on Saturday, the Friday, yeah, we get back Saturday, I think. Um, Wednesday, we have the inspectors coming from the Navy, because uh, a ship of that size every two years goes through what was called refresher training mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and then it was tailored ships training availability but you have the inspectors from the Navy come with all their checklists to make sure that you're ready to train and you you know all the safety procedures in place and all your manuals and your doctrine and everything it's a, it's a big thing you know when you think about how does a captain of the ship get evaluated it's how they do at, at TISTA and so we've got those folks coming on on Wednesday we get back, we haven't been, we, we've been gone for between the patrol and the shipyard a long time. And it's like, is XO, you know, I'm the, the enforcer, if you will, and like, all right, nobody gets any time off until we get through this inspection. And so Monday, um, we're working, and then Tuesday's 9-11. And, uh, you know, I, I remember I was in there talking with the captain, we had this one of our most junior sailors had been in trouble a lot, and it was, you know, we do. It was at the point to is it time for him to just be separated from the service? And so we we're in there watching that. And my, and my captain was uh, he was a news junkie before mm -hmm. there was I think the term was invented. Yeah. So he had always had the news on in the cabin, and so we were in there talking about this uh, particular individual, whether or not it was time to start the paperwork to discharge him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it had happened on the TV and we just were transfixed and it was like, all right, you know, where is everybody? Let's get them all back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're just out of the shipyard, we're ready to go. But what was interesting is um, Cape May, New Jersey, the draft of the ship, we had a lot of silting at our pier. So we could only come and go at high tide. Um, and because at low tide, we were literally sitting in the mud at the pier. And it was like, all right, what are the tides? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the next high tide is eight hours away. It's at night kind of thing. And it's, um, so we're ready to go. We get everybody back. We're, fortunately, we had re, you know, we, when we had come back from the shipyard, we had uh, taken on fuel and stores mm -hmm. and everything. We were ready. And then it was just, we were waiting for direction. Which, where are we gonna go? And so we got the order to go to New York. Um, and it's like, all right, well, we just missed the high tide. The next high tide is in the morning kind of thing. And so it's like, all right, get underway in the morning. Instead of get underway now, get mm -hmm. underway in the morning kind of thing. And so, um, so we got underway the next morning on the 12th. And we came out uh, Cape May and we turned north and then they called and uh, headquarters called basically and, and said, no, we've got enough up in New York already. We need you to go down to Norfolk. And so we, the entrance to Norfolk, the big Navy, the concern mm -hmm. was the Navy base and, and so and all the carriers and everything there. So we were basically, nothing could go in or out of Norfolk um, until we inspected it. Mm -hmm. And so that we did that for a good month. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, as everybody knows, just a life-changing kind of kind event of a, for a, the a whole crazy country. time. Yep. And then what comes out of that, initially Afghanistan gets the attention, but then in their infinite wisdom, the Bush administration decided to start putting pressure on Iraq mm -hmm. and starts rattling sabers and threatening to go into Iraq again. And in 2002, a lot of that stuff is happening. Um, and how does that wind up affecting you? 
Well, it, it um, in some ways it, it changed, you know, we, that, that harbor security mode, mm -hmm. um, if you will, for a ship of that size was not a traditional mission by any stretch right. of the imagination. So we're doing that um, and we're, um, we're working with some of the smaller, you know, harbor type units. Um, we're coordinating our efforts there. But the, uh, you know, there's still the, uh, the, the Haitian migration issue, you know, the migrant, and it, it's not just Haiti mm -hmm. also, you know, it's also from the Dominican Republic. Um, so we're constant, we're doing that. There's still the fisheries mission and there's still the drug mission. Mm -hmm. So, and then we're adding on this, you know, this um, harbor and port security mission. So it was kind of, it was like, it was not an either or, it was a, it was not, a, it, w it was more of an and. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, so you're doing a little bit of both, you know, it was not uncommon to, you know, the first part of your patrol might be harbor security, and then you'd go do one of the more traditional missions, and then the last part of your patrol would be harbor security kind of thing. So yeah, so it was, it was a, a different mindset for sure. To kind of on your way out and you're on your way back in and so forth, yep. and you, you, you do a shift on that. All right. Um, now, eventually, you wind up getting over to the Persian Gulf. Right. I, uh, so I, I ended my tour early in 2002 mm -hmm. uh, as XO, and I became um, the, a float detailer. So I, I go to headquarters in the personnel command, and so I'm the assignment officer. And I'm kind of like the, so I, I assign officers to ships mm -hmm. all over the country. And so the Coast Guard sends six patrol boats and crews to the Persian Gulf, right. and they're based out of Bahrain. Mm -hmm. And so very, cons you know, we want to make sure that they're taken care of and everything. And, and they've got unique requirements, training pipelines for mm -hmm. those folks. And, and we've got to make sure that when they come back, they, they get the right kind of assignment because of the, how they're deployed. And so I, I, in my role, I go over there for about a month and just work with them on their next assignments and then also helps me understand, um, you know, what the kind of people that I need to identify for the pipeline because mm -hmm. it's unique. The, the people, over, they shift from two-year tours to one-year tours, mm -hmm. you know, because they're out, out of the country. Right. And so it, it's, you know, it's not, it's double the effort. So I've got to make sure I've got that pipeline built up. Mm -hmm. so, I'm, so I'm over there working with them, you know, career counseling, helping them understand, um, you know, what's next for them, what's best for their career, uh, how this fits into that. And then at the same time, making sure that that pipeline's ready to go. All right. Now, uh, are you basically just working in an American base and, and with Americans, or do you have contact with either the locals or allies or anybody else while you're there? Sure. Uh, there was, uh, I think it was called Naval Support Base Bahrain mm -hmm. is where we were, which was a U.S. base. That, that's where I was, but yeah. I, I wasn't living on, the, or living on the base. I was off you know, in the community, and, and all of our crews were living in the community also when they weren't underway in the Arabian Gulf. Okay, and what kind of relationship was there between our people and the community at that point? It, 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 seemed, it seemed great. I mean, uh, at the time, it seemed Bahrain was, you know, was sort of a westernized. Yeah. Um, so it, it seemed like everybody fit in. There was not, uh, um, you know, some of the concerns that you might see, have mm -hmm. seen in some of the other countries there. Right. Okay. And so that was about a month long? Yep. I was over there for about a month, um, just making, like I said, making sure we had these people knew that we cared about them, you know, they weren't forgotten, that were there, and also understanding the requirements to make sure that we could build that pipeline mm -hmm. uh, coming back. And then, and then I went again the next year, the same sort of thing, to provide the same mm -hmm. sort of, you know, guidance and career counseling for those folks that yeah. are over there, because it's, it's you know, it's a, just a different mindset, they, you know, when they're coming back as far as keeping their careers on track. Okay. Now, I guess, I guess before the interview, we indicated that you went over there, that would have been in, in 03. Mm -hmm. after, the, after the invasion of Iraq had actually happened. Right. Right, okay. Uh, and that really becomes, a long, uh, I think, a going concern for a long time after that. We're rotating Navy mm -hmm. and Coast Guard people through the Gulf for a long time after that. Okay, all right. <coughs> so was your sort of home base, if you will, sort of the Coast Guard headquarters itself? Yep. Okay. Uh, and then how long did you stay there? Uh, I was there till 04. Okay. Uh, and then my next assignment, I was a commanding officer. I went as commanding officer of a 270-foot uh, ship with a crew of about 100. Mm -hmm. And that was the, f the forward. It was out of Portsmouth, Virginia. 
and again, uh, much more capable, you know, Navy weapon system, mm -hmm. Navy fire control radar, flight deck, Navy certified flight deck, those kinds of things. Um, and again, doing the same sort of missions, everything mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, fisheries in Georgia's bank to drug smuggling um, in the Caribbean and, and the migrant cases. And that was a, a two year assignment. Um, okay. and the particular events that took place during that tour that you want to bring in? Um, you know, it was we made a couple drug interdictions. The, the Coast Guard at that time had, had shifted to um, armed helicopters mm -hmm. um, because the, the drug smuggling had changed from, you know, sailboats and fishing boats yeah. to go fast, what we call go fast, just very high speed, right. uh, much faster than anything else. And so the response to that was to arm helicopters mm -hmm. with, with uh, precision marksmen that would shoot out the engines of these vessels. And so, you know, you'd usually have an airplane fixed wing that would spot them. Then you would get as close as we could, launch the helicopter, helicopter would go shoot the engines out, and then we would come and, and make do the introduction, in, interdiction, yeah. if you will. Okay. But we had, we had a great one with, um, uh, we were in the Caribbean, there was a Navy frigate was chasing one. They didn't have a precision marksman uh, in their helicopter. And they sort of chased it towards us. And we were able to actually, uh, we used our shipboard machine guns. Um, we were able to maneuver with the Navy frigate chasing. The helicopter was in the air, mm -hmm. kind of sort of nudging them. Yeah, not nudging, not the right word, but kind of giving them the incentive to go where the, mm -hmm. there was less wind, if you will. And, um, and we actually used the machine guns, uh, shipboard machine guns. We fired. Uh, two or three volleys of warning shots, and they gave up. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to make the, again, we, you know, our small boat goes over, makes the arrest, and gets the drugs, you know, uh, the big, it was an exciting drug bust, mm -hmm. but that, at the time to use shipboard machine guns for warning shots was, was very, very unusual. It had not mm -hmm. happened in over 10 years in the Coast Guard. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, and that assignment ends when? That assignment ends in 2006. Okay. And I'm very fortunate the Coast Guard sent me to grad school, graduate school again. So I went to the Sloan uh, School of Management at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. I was a Sloan Fellow. Um, and that's a you know, mid-career executive level program. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, I mean, with a global focus, um, really kind of give you that global strategic thought mm -hmm. kind of approach. And uh, so I did that, graduated in 2007. Um, and then I came to headquarters and I was on, worked for the CFO in uh, pretty much at the time we're kind of looking at like CFO transformation and I was on a couple of um, special project teams that were kind of developing, you know, sort of the new vision, the new roadmap uh, for the chief financial officer and how we would do resource allocation and, and kind of modernizing our system. So it was, uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a great experience. I did that for two years. Uh, now. You've got a couple of uh, stories that you wanted to bring in from your time on the ATU. So we're going to roll back a little bit from the CFO kind of assignment back to this one. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, wh when I was on the ATU, there were a couple of big things that were happening. There was another crisis in Haiti. And again, this time they were migrating in droves, you know, thousands, thousands a day. I mean, I want to say it was over 50,000 uh, that left over a couple of week period. and. And my ship was in the middle of that, the Atu. We, we went over from Puerto Rico and, you know, we showed up and it was uh, basically the, the sun would come up and you'd see the sailing vessels and you would just go come alongside, get the, get the migrants, the, the Haitians off um, and go find the next one and then get the next one and then get the next one. And then when your deck got full, you'd go, there would be a Navy ship somewhere that you would rendezvous with and transfer them all to the Navy. Um, and then they would take them to um, because they had much more carrying capacity. We could only have about 150 on our deck at a time. Mm -hmm. And then they would take them to Guantanamo Bay for processing and, and you know, as the political and those issues were, were played out. But all we were doing was saving lives. Okay. And it was just for, you, you didn't sleep. You know, you were just picking them up. We had, wow, we had one woman give birth on board. Uh, we found a, a ship in the night time. Uh, we got the, the got the people off. The, the ship was sinking. I mean, they were, mm -hmm. you know, knee deep in water. 
and at the bottom was a woman who was in active labor. We got her off, got her on board. Uh, her head was propped up on a on a life raft. We didn't have a couple blankets, and and she gave birth. And uh, you know, we had, had an e I had an EMT on board. That was about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she gave birth. Everybody was healthy and happy. And obviously, we worked very hard to get her to some advanced level of medical care. And, right. And uh, so we did that. And uh, so, I mean, that was just a crazy, crazy couple of weeks while yeah. we were doing that. Thousands of, of Haitians were crossed our deck. Now, did you stop any boat you saw, or did you let any go through if they were seaworthy and not overcrowded? Uh, no, we were, uh, well, yeah, I don't think we ever had that case okay. <laughs> where they looked seaworthy and, and looked like a normal merchantman or something. But uh, no, we, uh, it was just, again, thousands and thousands. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and so, it was kind of like our turn in the line. We had reached our limit, and so we went back to Guantanamo Bay and um, refueled and supplies and everything. And then it was, um, <clears throat> we got sent, we actually got sent to work with the Army, uh, Army Special Forces, because the, uh, at, um, you know, we had spent a, another part um, after that, after, you know, read all the rescues, and then there was another coup um, there was another pro you know, problem in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So we were up in Cap Haitian, which is in the northern part. We were doing the harbor security mm -hmm. there. And that was when the, you know, the uh, uphold democracy, there was the, the Haitian, um, there was a big gunfight mm -hmm. up there between some special forces and some locals. And we were up in Cap Haitian when that happened and we could hear it uh, as we were doing the, the port security. And then you know, we did all the rescues. And then there was also, uh, we worked with the Army Special Forces on the Southern Claw of Haiti. And what we, we picked up a, I don't know, a squad or a platoon, it was about eight or 12 Army Special Forces folks. And they couldn't get to the folks, they couldn't get to the towns in the Southern Claw of Haiti to kind of do their, their they're working on the pacification, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get the guns and everything. Um, so we, every morning we would, but before dawn, we'd find there'd be these different villages, and we would we would deliver these special forces folks, kind of, you know, a little maybe half a mile outside the village, if you will. We'd put them ashore, so then they could come into the village as everybody was waking up, and they could do their thing, and then we would pick them up at the end of the day. And so we did that across the whole South Claw for a couple of weeks, which was a really really kind of neat experience working with these folks and um, you know the the special all tremendous admiration for what they were doing every day and um, but it was really because you just flat out could not get to these areas mm -hmm. uh, uh, what the you know what we were trying to do post coup in Haiti um, politically and so we were providing the means for them to do that and you know every, every they would always bring back you know a bevy full of antique weapons and everything because they were working to pacify these areas to make sure they weren't in the hands of the, the Tantan Makuts, I think they were mm -hmm. called, you know, the, the bad people. Yeah. And um, so, we, and, and I remember one time they actually brought someone back. And so we then, we had to rendezvous with a, with a Navy ship because he was, he was a definitely a bad actor. And so he needed to get some special attention somewhere else. Yeah. Did they get into firefights when they went into these places? No, none of these folks. Because I think the the key was they were there as the village came awake, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean that's completely beyond my knowledge of right. tactics right. On, on land. But uh, but no, we they, yeah. they see everything seemed to go well, and maybe a lot of the local population really didn't mind having them scare off. Yeah, and that's kind of the sense that I got talking with them was um, when the village would wake up, they would say, hey, "Go go talk to that guy." Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing so all right uh, and was there anything else that went on in the, in the no what it were was those things you wanted to make sure yeah, those yeah that was good 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 okay so let's get you back now so what date have we gotten to in your main story you're now working with the CFO yep I, I had ju just uh, worked with the CFO um, on the uh, again uh, modernization of the, the architecture and the right. infrastructure that we have right. and, and some of our business processes and What's interesting, uh, I worked with this team that I was working on, and, and at the same time, keep in mind that the Coast Guard is completely reorganizing under a new commandant. And so that's part of why we were trying to do the, uh, 
kind of the business process reorganization, mm -hmm. because kind of the CFO umbrella underneath the bigger umbrella for the whole organization, a real visionary commandant. Mm -hmm. um, so he, uh, um, so when I'm, when I'm done with that, then I have an opportunity, I go to uh, uh, a 378, which again, getting back to what was my, mm -hmm. my new goal, was a captain of a 378. So it's a 378 foot ship, crew of 165 with you know, Navy weapon systems, Navy fire control radar, sea with uh, close in weapon system. You know, it, it's the most capital of the capital ships in, in the Coast Guard at the time. Mm -hmm. It was 50 years old, mind you. You know, we're, in, we're, we're at this point, the Coast Guard is modernizing the, these capital ships, and, uh, but they're, I'm, I'm still on an old one <laughs> kind right. of thing. And so that was out of San Diego. Okay, and what was it called? It was at the Chase. Okay. Well, I guess you made it, made it to the West Coast now. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm on the West Coast, and uh, and that, that I mean that was a I, I, that was a great experience. Did uh, um, two patrols on there, and then we just 50 year old ship. We had to do a major engine overhaul, and that that took a long time, over a year to do that. I had to replace a turbine, and then the diesel engine, you know, because we had gas turbines for high speed. These are as fast as the as the Atu was, you mm -hmm. know, a 30-knot ship. And so we had to uh, major engine overhaul, uh, gas turbine replacement. Um, and so we complete that right about the time it, the Coast Guard's starting to get these new capital ships online. And so the decision was made to decommission the chase. And so then we, you know, worked to decommission the ship. And the, the ship was actually given by the State Department to Nigeria the Nigerian mm -hmm. Navy. So we worked then with the Nigerians that came over and we, we transferred the ship to them in a ceremony. And then my, what was interesting was my crew, and we did this up in Alameda, my crew then, we cross-decked to the Sherman and then took the Sherman back to San Diego. And so the crew of the Sherman was actually the crew that, um, you know, they that was the crew that was uh, you know, decommissioned, if you will. Mm -hmm. We, my crew, the Chase crew, was now the crew of the Sherman, and the Sherman we took to San Diego. And we had we had to do that because these new capital ships that were coming online mm -hmm. um, was they needed space for it in Alameda. So that's why we took the uh, the Sherman back. Okay. And so I ended my tour as the commanding officer of the Sherman. Was that another 378 of the older type, or? No, these were the new ones. Oh, this is a new one. Okay. No, no, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The Sherman was a 378, yeah, but it was a new one that was replacing the Sherman, and that's why we had to take it to San Diego. Okay, now you mentioned a couple of patrols. Were those similar to what you had on the East Coast or Caribbean? Yep, uh, drug patrols off, off South America. Um, you know, and it's, you know, Galapagos. At, at this point, now the, the threat is, as the, the drug threat, you've got those those high speed craft that run coastal, but you've mm -hmm. also got um, at this point we call semi submersibles. You know, almost like, kind of not quite a submarine, but very low profile in the water. You know, snorkeling, mm -hmm. and and they try to go around everything. So you know, out by the Galapagos, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so yeah, so it's a completely different different. The the threat has evolved, and and we're, we're changing our tactics to that mm -hmm. to counter that threat. And was there an uh, integration component? Did you try to? Do you do you have boat people going up the west coast, or was that uh, not? Not, not you as saw? much. You do. Um, I, I don't remember that. But every when you do, it's usually um, they're from Asia, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Okay, so coming yeah. in across the Pacific, yeah. not yeah, up not out coming Mexico. up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it that you know that was a that was a neat experience, and that is, um, you know, I had not been in the canal or in the Pacific operating, you know, I, I, when I was on the Eagle mm -hmm. as a cadet, a lot of time in the Pacific. And then, um, well, I forgot to mention this, when I was on the, uh, on the uh, forward, we went through the canal because um, we did a, an exercise with the Navy and mm -hmm. all the countries of South America is called UNITAS. It's an annual exercise. And so we were part of a international battle group, if you will, and we spent uh, several weeks doing a bunch of different exercises and that was, that was a really fun experience working with you know Chilean Navy ships, Ecuadorian Navy ships, uh, Colombian ships I mean that, that was a really neat thing but you know I had not been operating in the Pacific since then mm -hmm. and so when I was on Chase and Sherman you know doing those those 
those drug patrols and the, it, you know, the distant, the Caribbean, um, you know, a couple of days you're going to see some land. You can go days <laughs> without seeing anything in the Pacific. You know, mm -hmm. the distances are, you know, just to get from, to get from San Diego to, generally you want to get down near like, um, where the canal is mm -hmm. and Colombia, Peru, yeah. that's kind of your, your mm -hmm. area, if you will, your, your target area. Um, I mean, that takes a long, that's several days. That's like five or six days to yeah. get there. And so. there's not a bunch of islands in the middle either. Nope, not at all, not at all. But, uh, but yeah, it was just, it was just fascinating. We got to Peru and, you know, and so the Sherman is my last ship, if mm -hmm. you will, on the Coast Guard. And, uh, cause at this point I'm, I'm a captain. I'm, too senior <laughs> to mm -hmm. go anywhere else. And, and so that was, you know, at that my 12 years of sea duty at that point, um, you know, that was kind of, that was very bittersweet for me because mm -hmm. that, that's really what I enjoyed so much about being in the Coast Guard was the opportunity to go to sea. Okay. So when did you leave the Sherman? Uh, I left the Sherman in 2011. Okay. And I went to, uh, at this point, like I said, there's no more sea. Mm -hmm. Opportunity. So, to, for my career, the, the best move for my career is to become like a chief of law enforcement at a district, a district command, mm -hmm. kind of like when I was the admiral's aide. Yeah, that, that's a district command. And so, I had this opportunity to go to Alaska, a place I'd never been to before. And uh, but it was the right job up in Alaska to be the chief of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And the way there was probably going to be an opportunity to become my boss, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, talked. I, I had remarried in, in 2009 uh, when I was on Chase, and um, I, I had met her in grad school. She was from Norway, and so we went up to uh, went up to Alaska and uh, I, I spent three years in Alaska. I was the chief of law enforcement, and then later the chief of operations for all of Alaska. And you know, a couple of big things he did there. Um, you know, we have disputed borders. Uh, we have disputed borders with international boundaries with with Russia mm -hmm. and we have two with Canada most people don't know one north of Alaska and one's uh, um, down near Seattle mm -hmm. but we have disputed borders and so spent a lot of disputed boundaries so I spent a lot of time with the Russians making sure that because we, we coordinated with the Russians the Far East uh, border guards um, you know search and rescue cases especially anything near that boundary to make sure that Mm -hmm. Everything was good, you know, and, and fishing and everything. Everybody stayed on their side of the line. And so twice a year, we'd get together with them and just talk through what we're working on. We had protocols in place for communication, things mm -hmm. like that. So I got to see some parts of the eastern, you know, eastern Russia that, you know, many people never, never get the opportunity yeah. to see. But, to you know, sit down with them. And I was on a lot of international uh, fisheries committees, um, um, commissions, uh, the North Pacific um, Fisheries Commission, and then the internet. It was an international halibut commission, and then a salmon commission. You know, so it, like salmon, we got together with um, Korea, Japan, Russia, Canada, and the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, we figure out different quotas, and you know how because we want to preserve the stocks, obviously. Right. But th those were those meetings were, you know, it was like classic State Departments. You know, you have the microphone in your ear for the translation and everything, you know, because we'd have our, our uh, interpreters that would do all that work for us when, the, you know, the Russian would be speaking in Russian so we could, uh, so we could understand. And it just, it was as fascinating to watch that work. Um, so I did that. And then the other big thing was I was the, um, my boss maybe, at this point, the Arctic's starting to become uh, a, uh, an, uh, not an issue, but an opportunity. You know, because it had been ice in forever, mm -hmm. things are starting to warm up. There's now, the Arctic is not iced all the time kind right. of thing. And so it's an, it's an ocean. Coast Guard, it's an ocean. The U.S. has territorial waters up there. Uh, um, it's, we got to figure out what's our Arctic policy. So Arctic policy is starting to become a big thing. And the Coast Guard had not had a sustained presence in the Arctic for, you know, probably 100 years at this point. So I don't know. I'm mean, traditionally how far up the coast of Alaska, and you have like at Nome, for instance. Yep. Uh, but not up at Barrow or somewhere up on top. Right. 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 Yeah. Because the, and the Arctic Circle um, is between Nome and Barrow. Okay. But you know a sustained presence in those areas had it had been a long time since the Coast Guard had that. So 
kind of put in charge and I had a great team to put together basically a six or is it, is not, not, we, the first year was like a 90 day presence in the Arctic, a sustained presence. Mm -hmm. Ships, boats, helicopters, um, we're doing a lot of village outreach. <clears throat> uh, you know, we want to be able to, we want these folks to welcome the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, you know, we brought dentists up there, you know, to um, public health doctors, things like that, you know, just to, to you know, kind of bring the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in these kinds of opportunities and capabilities to these areas um, that had traditionally been underserved by that, you know, just because of the remoteness. And so that was a year-long effort, and, and it was called Arctic Shield, and we, uh, we pulled it off. And, but, I mean, I spent a lot of time going to these villages and talking with, with the elders and the tribal leaders and the elected leaders, just talking with them. What is it that, you know, this is what we're hoping to do. You know, we want to partner with you and, you know, trying to gain the trust mm -hmm. and, and everything. And it, I mean, that's a, that takes a long time. And, yeah. and we worked a lot hard at that and, and it's it just amazing things you learn um, that I learned real eye-opening because I'll never forget the one conversation it was like hey you know we're talking about we'd like to bring some helicopters here do some exercises train with your search and rescue folks um, and, and then just have this presence you know in case people get in trouble and etc cetera, etc cetera. and they're like like well we don't want you to come in August because that's when the caribou migrate. We're mm -hmm. afraid the, and we're subsistence hunters, and we're afraid the noise from the helicopters will scare the caribou away. How about you come in July? Like, okay, you know, easy yeah, enough, yeah. but you know, just those those kinds of things that you never think of. And, and so, so we worked all that, but again, it took, literally, it took six, nine months of, of conversations and understanding, and, and we were able to do, I thought was very, very successful. Um, presence, you know, because it had never been done before, uh, you know, br to bring helicopters, you know, mm -hmm. over the over the mountains and everything and get you know, of Alaska to get up to the North Slope. You know, Where were you actually headquartered? I was in Juneau. Okay. And this was amazing. If, if you, you know, most people don't understand how big Alaska is. If you overlay Alaska on the continental U.S. Mm -hmm. So we're in Juneau. We're planning. So we're planning the operation in Atlanta. Mm hmm for something that's going to happen in Montana mm -hmm. and we're going to resupply it out of San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that was the deep water port, which was Dutch Harbor. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling when you think of the vastness of, of Alaska and what we're doing up there. But it, it was just, it was a great experience. My wife and I, we, our daughter was born mm -hmm. there. So, I, you know, I have three daughters. One was born in Puerto Rico. And one was born in Alaska. I don't think you get much farther apart. And then my middle daughter was born in Bethesda, Maryland. <laughs> Probably just as well that your wife was from Norway, though. If you're going to go up to Alaska, <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but it was, you know, I had spent my whole career trying to avoid Alaska, mm -hmm. and it was a, it was a great experience. Those three years that we spent there. So when did you finish that? Uh, I wrapped that up 2014. Okay. And then I went to Coast Guard headquarters. Very. It was not a position I wanted. Mm -hmm. I was looking for something else, to be quite frank. Um, but the service needed me. And having been a former detailer or assignment mm -hmm. officer, I understood. Um, and so I went, I was the chief budget officer for the Coast Guard. So it was called the Office of Budget and Programs. But I was the you know executive budget director for the Coast Guard. Worked directly for the chief financial officer. And in a federal agency, the budget, budget reigned supreme. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, the, this office, some of the most talented and brightest officers in the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. uh, there's about 30 of them worked in there and, and somehow I was, I was supposed to lead them, but they, you know, <laughs> they were, they were just amazing, amazing folks. Um, and it, like I said, it's the most talented people in all of the Coast Guard and, and we just worked the budget. You know, we had to work the budget internally, obviously mm -hmm. we had to work the budget with the Department of Homeland Security and then we had to work. Uh, the budget with uh, Office of Management and Budget, and then also the, uh, on the Hill. You know, so we spent a lot, I spent a lot of time, and my folks spent a lot of time up on Capitol Hill, sitting down with professional staffs for committees, uh, members of Congress, working with our congressional liaison office, just explaining, you know, helping them understand why the, the capital ship program was so important to the future of the Coast Guard. And, and, you know, these folks, 
if they were all like me, had, you know, had been on a ship mm -hmm. or had been just in the cockpit of an airplane, and they could, you know, tell the senator face to face, you know, I was doing X and it broke, let me, because it's so old kind mm -hmm. of thing. That's why we need new ships kind of thing. And so it was just a, I mean, really, it was a, learned so much about how important that work was mm -hmm. and, and how val and what it meant to the Coast Guard and the organization. And there's trade-offs happening. You know, the department's making trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, OMB's making trade-offs. Congress is making trade-offs. And, you know, the administration and Congress might not be of the same persuasion, if you will. So, it, yeah, a lot of negotiation. And then we're dealing with continuing resolutions and everything. And, mm -hmm you know, how to mitigate that and, and just providing that information to the decision makers and, you know, supporting our commandant or our, our chief executive mm -hmm. officer essentially for um, when he's doing his testimony on, on the Hill and everything, you know, he's, he's sitting there and I'm right behind him kind of thing, slipping him notes every once in a while, you know, making sure he's prepped. So it was, uh, it was, it was an amazing job, but it was a meat grinder job. You know, it was, I remember one day I left the office at midnight and I wasn't the last to leave kind of so it was, uh, well, it was for the service, it was for a short period, it was for two years, mm -hmm. short period of time. And, you know, with it, we honestly felt without us doing what we were doing, because we were supporting the, you know, the 35,000 folks and 40,000 folks in the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. that, you know, if we let, we couldn't let them down. And so right. that, that's what kept us going. You have to have, make sure the money still shows up. Absolutely. And get it for the things you, you want. Uh, and making people understand that can be kind mm -hmm. of an, an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, and this ends in 2016? 2016. 2016. And then my last assignment, I'm the chief of staff of a district, the 5th mm -hmm. district in Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, and, and we, you know, and that was, you know, districts, they're doing a lot of the, uh, you know, they oversee search and rescue, obviously, all the coastal search mm -hmm. and rescue stations. And it was for five states. It was Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North, North, North Carolina, but not South Carolina, and New Jersey. Okay. And uh, so all the coastal search and rescue, mm -hmm. all the, the port operations, port security, we have air stations, um, uh, search and rescue stations, and the small, the patrol boats, mm -hmm. buoy tenders, all those missions um, that we're overseeing and just providing that kind of support, you know, whether it's uh, financial support, facility support, IT support, personnel support, all those kinds of things so that they can, uh, my boss, the Admiral, she was the operational commander of all those and, mm -hmm. and, our, and our staff was just, you know, making that happen. We had a couple big events, you know, we had a big hurricane come through, uh, one each summer actually, and, you know, they, they both hit um, in, the Carol in North Carolina. Yeah. Lots of flooding, lots of destruction down there. Um, just to me, and some of the flooding was 100 miles inland, which was mm -hmm. really weird. But we we're, you know, we were getting pontoon boats and those kinds of things going out and helping folks get out of their homes and stuff. So I mean, just a, a, amazing, you know, just situational leadership, if you will, and mm -hmm. you know, in crisis. So I mean, it was a, it was a great experience. Okay, uh, now you work with a lot of different kinds of people over the course of that career. I want to ask you a little bit about. As the ordinary crewman, the enlisted personnel on the different boats you were working on, uh, what kind of impressions did you have of them? Uh, uh, amazing, talented folks. I mean, it was, you know, I, I when I was on the the 378, meeting these folks that, you know, I anytime we get a new person on the ship, they got to see me like within the mm -hmm. first couple of days, kind of uh, the captain sit down and talk with them. But you know, these these folks, some most junior enlisted graduate, you know, college degrees, some had graduate degrees. I mean, it's, they're just talented folks that just want to serve, you know, after 9-11, mm -hmm. the, the motivation and the stories were just amazing, but they're truly, truly dedicated folks, really want, wanting to do the best thing and, and, and just work hard workers. I mean, really, I, I was very fortunate. Everywhere I went, I was just surrounded by just talented people. Okay, and they go through a pretty rigorous training too, don't they? I mean, if you're gonna begin, yeah. Coast Guard, because I remember interviewing someone who was like in the Coast Guard in the 70s and he was describing the training program he went through and you know, being thrown into the water in awful conditions mm -hmm. and all of this kind of stuff. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's boot camp just that everybody does. Yeah. And then depending on what your special, you know, if you're an electrician or a, 
or um, uh, engine mechanic or whatever, you're going to go through that kind of specialty training. Sounds like the person you were talking to is probably like a rescue yeah. swimmer, yeah. kind of thing, crazy person that jumps out of a helicopter mm -hmm. kind of thing. But yeah, absolutely. Okay, you have a lot. All right. So your last tour then ends in 2018. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did you just decide at that point it was time to retire, or was that a standard time to go out? That was, yeah, I was at, well, I was at 30 years, and um, mm -hmm. so uh, that was the end. Yeah. But I had, I had targeted that date for probably a couple of years, mm -hmm. and I had planned my transition, right. if you will. So it was, it was yeah, that's when I, that, that was the end, if you will, but I knew it was coming, and, and so it was, it was perfect. And, and I had made a decision, I wanted to transition into higher ed finance a several years before, and so I, I had been working on that. So it was, it was perfect timing for me, and it was the right time for my family. I'd done everything I wanted to accomplish in the Coast Guard, and it was just, I couldn't be happier with, you know, it, like I said, it was a, thinking back 34 years when I made the decision to go mm -hmm. to the Coast Guard Academy, it was, um, I, I just can't believe it's over already. All right, so what position did you move on to then? Oh, sure, I'm at uh, Grand Valley State University. I'm the Vice President for Finance and Administration and the Chief Financial Officer. And how did you wind up with that job? Uh, like I said, all I wanted to do was higher ed finance. Yep. And it was, I was looking, I had lived all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I was looking nationwide at opportunities. And it was, it, the, the timing was right mm -hmm. and through the interview process. Um, it, it's kind of a funny story. I, as I'm lining up my, um, uh, you know, I want to line up my references. I'm about ready to start doing interviews, mm -hmm. so I, I want to line up references. And I talked to one of, talked to a former boss, to be a reference. And he's like, absolutely. And I said, I want to get into higher ed, finance. He's like, you should talk to. I went to college with this guy. He was like the associate dean at the Harvard Business School, basically mm -hmm. the CFO for the Harvard Business School. I said, you need to talk to him. And so I talked. You know, I talked with him, and he gave me some great pointers and advice. And he said, you should talk to a dean, so a dean knows so you know what a dean wants. Mm -hmm. And so he connects me with a dean at, at Yale, um, and I talk with him, and he, great advice, great pointers. He said, you know, you should probably talk to a president to know what a president wants in a CFO. Mm -hmm. And he says, I know this guy named Tom Haas at Grand Valley. And I was like, really? <laughs> so he connects me with him. And uh, when I was at the Coast Guard Academy playing baseball, one mm -hmm. of the reasons I went to the Coast Guard Academy, Tom Haas was an assistant baseball coach. Mm -hmm. And so, but then I didn't talk to him for 30 years. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, and so I did an inter, you know, an informational interview with him just to right. find out what a president wants and a CFO. And, um, and then at the end he goes, you know, we're, we're about to advertise for a CFO. You know, here's the name of the, the search firm. If, yeah. if you're interested, reach out. And so, and I went through the whole process and here I am. I can't believe it. Yeah. Small world. Yeah. And it doesn't really, in the end, look like kind of Coast Guard nepotism in the sense that you, you had a resume by then. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that was, was, was a pretty remarkable thing. And sometimes finding people for positions at a you know, regional state university isn't always that easy. Mm -hmm. but yeah, anyway. Uh, and so you, you've been here then, what, since 2018? Correct. Okay. And done that ever since. And, and I guess you move the money around, you don't decide how it's spent, so I can't hit you up for money. Uh, <laughs> All right, now look back over um, the time that you spent in the Coast Guard. Are there any other particular things that stand out in your memory that you haven't brought into the story yet? No, I think that, uh, you know, when I reflect back on career, and I think I talked about this earlier, it always seemed like given more responsibility and opportunity than probably I just merited, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But it's, but it's just, that's just kind of the mentality of the Coast Guard. It's like, get out there, get it done, and, uh, and we got your back, and, and and it was it was just an amazing, amazing experience, surrounded by amazing people, and uh, I, I just, you know, when I think about you know special operations with, uh, you know, special operators or you know doing drug interdictions, testifying at trials, mm -hmm. um, uh, subsequent trials. I, I remember I was a an expert that testified before Congress, you know, because I had, I when I was on the the ATU, we had just made a drug bust mm -hmm. um, using some night vision equipment that enabled us to do it, uh, wh which at the time was not widely around. Right. And so, and so there was a, a hearing on on drug interdiction. How can we improve mm -hmm. it? And I was in, and so I went from Puerto Rico to Washington D.C. in the middle of winter, 
And I was part of a panel, that, and I talked about how night vision goggles mm -hmm. could be a game changer um, on ships. And, and you know, that kind of opportunity, you know, and I was at the time a lieutenant, you mm -hmm. know, I'm a lieutenant testifying before a congressional committee. So, I mean, it's just, it's amazing when you think about those kinds of experiences that I was able to have. All right. Well, it makes for an unusual, interesting story. So thank you very much for coming and sharing it today. Oh, thank you so much. I enjoyed it.